Solid Eat Cop. Four hour work week. We're back. Yay. So yesterday we covered deal, right? Definition of, of what it looks like, the objectives of the new game, the overall uh, framework. Elimination, which is time, how to manage your time and hack time. Um, automation, which leads to automated income that you don't have to be involved in to generate. Huge passive. Passive income is another term for that. Uh, liberation, which is uh, mobility, the freedom to go anywhere, anytime, even if it's nowhere. You know, just being in control of, of your ability to get out of the place you grew up in, which will definitely expand your horizons and make you a bigger, broader person, right? So he continues. I should note that most bosses are less than pleased if you spend one hour in the office each day and employees should therefore read the steps in the entrepreneurial minded entrepreneurial minded deal D E A L order but implement them D E L A so he switches the E and the A in the middle if you're an employee of a company right now. If you decide to remain in your current job, it's necessary to create freedom of location before you cut your work hours by 80%. Even if you have never considered becoming an entrepreneur in the modern sense, the DEAL process will turn you into an entrepreneur in the pure sense. As first coined by French economist J.B. Say in 1800, one who shifts economic resources out of an area of lower and into an area of higher yield. That's an interesting, I've never heard that definition of an entrepreneur before. One who shifts economic resources out of an area of lower yield and into an area of higher yield. Yeah, just maximizing your yield or your return. That's, that's a good definition. I, I agree with it. Last but not least, much of what I recommend will seem impossible and even offensive to basic common sense. I expect that. Resolve now to test the concepts as an exercise in lateral thinking. If you try it, you'll see just how deep the rabbit hole goes, and you won't ever go back. Take a deep breath, and let me show you my world. And remember, tranquilo, relax. It's time to have fun and let the rest follow. Tim Ferriss, Tokyo, Japan. Dude's writing this from Japan, right? The mobility, mobility. September 29, 2006. So the book came out in 2007, but I know he started writing it in like 2002 is what the, the uh, time frame that he's describing these things that happened when he had Brain Quick and LLC. Crow, where are we at? Two minutes, good, we're good. Uh, chronology of a pathology, okay? Uh, an expert is a person who has made all the mistakes that can be made in a very narrow field. <laughs> Amen, brother. Um, Talking to a guy, William, new recruit for One Realty Corp last night. Yeah, I'm still recruiting over here. I'm a fucking beast. You ain't never met a motherfucker like me, right, Kid Rock? Same, same, same. So I'm recruiting over here. I was talking to a, a new agent, and, um, you know, I told him, yeah, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, dude, the only good thing, the only good thing about being old is the experience that comes with it. Been there, done that. You know, you're making mistakes now at 40, that I made, you know, 17 years ago when I was 40, right? Or when I was 35 or when I was 21 or when I was 51 and you know, did the insurance thing, right? But every time I fucked up, I've learned from it, right? And gotten better. What are we trying to do here? Get a little bit better every day, right? So it's all good. So yeah, I, I am an expert in that. I've made a shit ton of mistakes and I've learned from them. Uh, and they can be made in a very narrow field because, you know, that way you're going to run into that situation again. If you make mistakes just all over the fucking place and make a mess, there's too many things that the chances are you're not going to do that, that one thing again. But in a narrow field, like real estate investing, you're going to do the same thing again, but this time you're going to do it better because you learn from fucking up, right, mistakes. Uh, who said that? Niels Bohr, B-O-H-R, uh, Danish physicist and Nobel Prize winner. There you go. So he made a lot of mistakes on, to, I'm not familiar with his work, and I'm sure he did something great to get the Nobel Prize, and uh, he, he did that great thing by screwing up a bunch of times. Uh, next quote, ordinarily he was insane, but he had lucid moments when he was merely stupid. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'd say that describes me pretty good too. Especially now, uh, losing my memory. Uh, Heinrich Heine. <laughs> All right, yeah, I still think farts are funny. So Heinrich Heine, H-E-I-N-E, -E, German critic and poet. Ordinarily, he was insane, but he had lucid moments when he was merely stupid. Okay. I'm not sure how to interpret that, that one. I'm not getting it. But Okay. This book will teach you the precise principles I have used to become the following. Princeton University guest lecturer in high-tech entrepreneurship. First American in history to hold a Guinness World Record in tango. Okay, so he did the, Guinness, the five months of training. He holds a Guinness World Record for that. It's pretty cool. Uh, advisor to more than 30 world record holders in professional Olympic sports. Yeah. War, uh, Wired Magazine's greatest self-promoter of 2008. Yeah, He does puff his chest out a bit, which is okay. I'm, I'm willing to put up with the ego to get the information. And he's a lot more... Uh, introspective now he's not he doesn't puff his chest out at 40 like he did at 20 imagine that right he he's grown he's grown a lot as a person if you watch his latest stuff uh national chinese kickboxing champion that's pretty fucking cool right to go over and do their sport right because martial arts has been around in asia a lot longer than in america and so he went over there and won the championship that's Fuck it. And he talks about how in this book. And once again, it's a hack. Just like the tango thing. It's a hack. He solved the problem. Creative thinking. Brilliant guy. Uh, horse bar horseback archer. Uh, Yabu Sumi in Nikko, Japan. So in Japan, they have competitions where you're on a horse and you ride by its speed and shoot an arrow into a target. Pretty cool. Different. Something that a lot of us haven't done. He not only did it, but, well, no, okay, so was, there's no champion there or whatever, but he did it. He rode a horse and shot an arrow. That's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> Political asylum researcher and activist, helping people come over to the country or from oppressive regimes. That's pretty cool. MTV breakdancer in Taiwan. Okay, it's a, hey, it's not boring, right? It might not be your cup of tea, but it's not fucking boring. It's better than what you did yesterday, better than what I did yesterday, which is help a friend move a mattress, right? And then eat a shitload of Japanese barbecue. So, breakdancer for MTV in Taiwan. Hurling competitor, you know, hurling uh, in uh, Ireland. Uh, actor on hit TV series. There you go, he got on a TV show uh, in China and Hong Kong. Uh, human Cargo is the name of the show. So, looks like he has some fun in China, man, and, the, and Japan, and Taiwan, and Ireland. <laughs> um, how I got to this point is a tad less glamorous. I, I, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to read this. Like, 1977, born six weeks, premature. Well, yeah, I guess it, it helps to have background. I'll, I'll, I'll plow through this. He was born six weeks premature, given a 10% chance of living. Holy shit. That's amazing. I survive instead and grow so fat that I can't roll onto my stomach. <laughs> Holy shit. Wow. Little fucking butterball, man. And if you've seen the dude now, he's lean. He's He's been lean since he's written this book. So he obviously got that shit under control, but... <laughs> He's so fat as a baby, he can't roll onto his stomach. Oh, my God. Uh, a muscular imbalance of the eyes makes me look in opposite directions. Holy fuck. He was born like a mongoloid child. That's crazy. And my mother refers to me affectionately <laughs> as tuna fish. <laughs> fuck me. <laughs> yeah, I'm... Obviously, I'm going to hell because I laugh at shit like that. But, man, that <laughs> fucking mom calls him tuna fish. <laughs> His eyes are all fucked up. and He's, he's a little fat, roly-poly baby. Oh, my God. Dude, this is insane. So far, so good. But, you know, he, he overcame, right? I mean, look at his life now. He, he fucking overcame a lot. 1983, nearly fell kindergarten because I refused to learn the alphabet. My teacher refuses to explain why I should learn it. 
opting instead for I'm the teacher, that's why. Yeah, I had a problem with that shit too, a lot, when I was younger. I tell her that's stupid and ask her to leave me alone so I can focus on drawing sharks. She sends me to the bad table instead and makes me eat a bar of soap. Fuck me, I didn't know they still did that shit in 1983. Disdain for authority begins. I'm with you, Tim. Yeah, most authority has their head up their ass and don't know what the fuck they're doing. Uh, 1991, my first job. So, what's it? 77, he's born. So, 14 years old, he gets his first job. Uh, ah, the memories. I'm hired for minimum wage as the cleaner at an ice cream parlor and quickly realize that the big boss's methods duplicate efforts. So, he's life hacking at 14. That's awesome. I do it my way, finish in one hour instead of eight, and spend the rest of the time reading kung fu magazines and practicing karate kicks outside. I am fired in a record three days, left with the parting comment, maybe someday you'll understand the value of hard work. It seems I still don't. Good answer. Good answer. Now you can kind of see why he developed this thing, right? Because it's Shit like that, which is all too common. I think everybody's got a story like that, right? Where they, they're in a fucking thankless, dead-end job, and the boss is all like, you know, I'm your boss, you got to listen to me, and then, fuck you, you know? You're an asshole. You're making 30 grand a year. I, I can make that in a flip. Screw you. Uh, still seems I still don't. 1993, I volunteer for a one-year exchange program in, in Japan. So 16 years old, he goes to Japan. That's pretty fucking awesome. So there... Once again, the mobility, the wanderlust, not a lot of 16-year-olds go to Japan for a, a year. That's, that's fucking strong. You can, see, you can see what shaped him, what turned him into what he is today. Where people work themselves to death. That's true. In Japan, it's a phenomenon called Karushi, K-A-R-O-O-S-H-I. And are said to want to be Shinto when born, Christian when married, and Buddhist when they die. I conclude that most people are really confused about life. <laughs> Amen. One evening, intending to ask my host mother to wake me the next morning, Okusu, Oku, Okusu, I ask her to violently rape me, Okasu. She is very confused. <laughs> Can you rape me in the morning? <laughs> Fuck me. Why, well, yeah, I can see her being confused. Can you please rape me, violently rape me in the morning? Um, yeah, 1996. Uh, I managed to slip undetected into Princeton despite SAT scores 40% lower than the average. Holy shit. And my high school admissions counselor telling me to be more realistic. <laughs> I conclude I'm just not good at reality. I major in neuroscience and then switch to East Asian studies to avoid putting printer jacks on cat heads. Okay? Um, but real quick, the guidance counselor telling me to be more realistic, the admissions counselor, be more realistic. Who the fuck are you to tell me to be more realistic? Why are you killing my dreams and goals? Because you're a fucking loser work, you know, working in some high school somewhere, you know, for what, 20, 30 grand a year, 40 You're a fucking loser. You drive a fucking Yugo or a Pinto or something. You, Fuck you telling me what I can and can't do, right? Remember I said you got to have that little bit of the attitude, you know, fuck you. Fuck this dude. Be more realistic. You can't get into Princeton. Guess what, motherfucker? He got into Princeton. You were wrong. You're a worthless piece of shit, and you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Screw you. Got to get a little bit of that chip on your shoulder, guys, because otherwise you'll meekly believe douchebags like that and not follow your dreams. Fuck them, follow your dreams. Just because they can't do it doesn't mean you can't do it. Right? Or Tim can't do it. He did it, right? He's a hundred times more successful than that admissions counselor. Right? But that smug little shit was like, oh, be more realistic. You can't do that. Fuck you. Who the hell are you to tell me what I can and can't do? Right? Let it sink in, guys. <laughs> be strong. Self-confidence. Build it from inside. Uh, ba -ba -ba, printer jacks on cat heads. Yeah, just uh, whatever. 1997, millionaire time. I create an audio book called How I Beat the Ivy League. Use all my money from three summer jobs to manufacture 500 tapes and proceed to sell exactly none. Failure makes you stronger. You learn, right? 
but at least he had the balls to try. How many times have you had an idea and not run with it? Right? Fuck it, dude. Do it. Jump in the fucking pool and start swimming. He did. Hey, so he lost his money. So fucking what? He made more, right? Money is not a one-time thing. It's a commodity. It comes and it goes. And don't never stop investing in yourself just because you, you lost the first one. You lose one round, the, the, the fight's not over. He got, as long as you're still standing, the fight's not over. Uh, da, 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 manufacture 500 tapes, sell none. I will allow my mother to throw them out only in 2006. <laughs> Just nine years of denial later. <laughs> Such is the joy of baseless overconfidence, right? Because he didn't know enough to do it, but at least he friggin' did it. And, um, you know, I was in one of the prior readings, I said a buddy of mine said you're, and I forgot the thing, it's ready, aim, fire. And he said, you're ready, fire, aim. And he, he's right. And so was Tim. And how you like us now, right? So it's okay to be ready, fire, aim, right? No, no problem there. Uh, 1998, after four shot putters kick a friend's head in, shot putters, shot putters, after four shot putters kick a friend's head in, I quit bouncing. The highest paying job on campus. So he was bouncing at a bar, even though he's not a big dude. Interesting. Uh, and develop a speed reading seminar. So he got his ass kicked with the, with the uh, how I beat the Ivy League thing. And here he is um, doing a speed reading seminar. He didn't give up. He didn't quit. He kept hustling. He kept grinding. He kept pushing. Huge. Uh, I plaster the campuses with hundreds of god-awful neon green flyers that read, triple your reading speed in three hours, and prototypical Princeton students proceed to write bullshit on every single one. I sell 32 spots at $50 each for a three-hour event, and $533 per hour convincing, convinces me that finding a market, here we go, nugget, nugget alert, Finding a market before designing a product is smarter than the reverse, right? So he made the how to beat the Ivy League product without knowing if anybody actually wanted to buy a tape about beating the Ivy League. He didn't do any market research. He didn't have a customer before he created the product. With the flyers, he puts it out there at minimal cost, right, printing off a bunch of flyers, sees that he gets people signing up. Now he's got demand for his product. Now he knows he can make money in what is five hundred and thirty-three dollars per hour. Pretty good money. You could use that, right? You like to make five hundred bucks an hour. All right. So two months later, I'm bored to tears of speed reading and close up shop. I hate services and need a product to ship. Services require you to be there. Services that you're providing, personal services like real estate agent, <laughs> you've got to be there. You've got to show them the house. You've got to, you know. So he, he, he did something. He made money. But more importantly, he learned two huge things from that business. One, find the market before designing the product. Two, services businesses are not as good as a product to ship because you have to be there. You have to be involved. You physically have to show up, which is no good. So it was 18 minutes. I went too long. I'm not going to finish it. There's more of his progression in life. I'll do it tomorrow. I want to keep these shorts. Uh, I didn't even want to do 18 minutes. That's my bad. Um, that's it. That's it for today. A lot of good stuff. And, and I'm leaving it there because those are two really good nuggets. So if you get nothing else but those two things, we've accomplished something today. <laughs>